Hi, everyone. My name is Pam Hatchfield. I'm an objects and sculpture conservator, and I serve as the coordinator for Held in Trust, a four-year collaboration between the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation. This project takes a look at the challenges and opportunities facing preservation and conservation of cultural heritage through the lens of critical issues facing many areas of the field today. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you a bit about this project and its relevance to you and your constituents. The challenges of preserving digital media are, as you know better than anyone, immense. We hope you'll find the project useful, even inspirational, as we navigate our way forward into the future. So I will give you a brief background on the scope of the project and my colleagues, Linda Todich and Paul Macier will dig deeper into the needs and priorities that the Digital Technology Working Group identified. Next. We gathered a steering committee of experts in the field and allied professions to identify areas of study develop working groups and an advisory council of allied organizations who could help develop and guide this work. And here you see the areas of study that we investigated in black and the broad concepts which impacted them all. Some of these working groups are more conceptual in nature like philosophy and ethics, inclusivity and equity, engagement and communication, while others are more functional, if I can use that word, focusing either on the tools that we use to treat, examine, and document, like digital technology, science and technology, collection care and preventive conservation, education, professional development and leadership, and field investment, infrastructure, and health all focus on the infrastructure of the field, how we learn, practice, and fund the work of preservation and conservation. And that leaves climate crisis and environmental impact, which surely overshadows and profoundly impacts what we are able to do, how we do it, and how we will work in the future. In fact, it was seen as so critical and fundamental that we immediately created a supplemental project to held in trust called Climate Resilience Resources for Cultural Heritage. It is also funded by the NEH and is ongoing right now. These working groups develop comprehensive reports in each area, focusing on specific short-term, medium-term, and long-term needs. Next. So for example, in the case of digital technology, here's a very abbreviated example of what the implementation of one goal would look like. And Paul and Linda are gonna go into this with you in some detail. Uh, but you can see that this is just one of their three goals, and within that goal, there are short-term, mid-term, and long-term um, approaches that are very specific in nature. Next. Our long-form reports will fill out the bare bones that you've seen with lots of detail and ideas for initiatives, but if I had to distill the 260-odd page report, into one sentence, it would be represented by this statement. A vibrant and resilient future for conservation and preservation depends upon the development of new, highly collaborative paradigms and structures grounded in social justice, equity, and environmental action. Next. So I invite you to check out the Held in Trust website. You'll find the full report there, summaries of the reports, and a link to view the National Convening for Held in Trust, which was held at the Library of Congress last April. And here is the QR code on the right if you want to take a look. And now Linda and Paul will give you a deeper look at the findings of their working group. Thank you, Pam. So uh, the working group, Digital Technology Research and Practice, Paul Messier and I, Linda Tadic, we are the co-chairs of the group. And this was one of nine reports in the Held in Trust project. Next slide. Uh, we identify, the working group identified three overarching issues with digital technology. Number one is that the field of cultural heritage preservation, we have to adapt the preservation and conservation needs of technology-driven works of art, 
objects, artifacts, images, experiences. What can be technology-driven works of art or any object? Well, think about film, video, audio, images which use a camera to create them, digital works, software-based works, works created by AI. All of those were created by using some kind of technology to create them, but you also need technology in order to view them, to access them, to use them, and you need technology then to preserve these objects also over time. So this was really one of the very critical aspects of the or issues that we identified. And then related to this, of course, is then you have these objects, if they're analog originally, they're going to be digitized, or you have born digital objects. And so you need digital preservation solutions in order to keep these the content that is on these objects alive. Because again, we want to focus here with digital preservation on preserving the essence, the content that is then embodied within a digital file within or these technology ob uh, created or used objects. So, but oftentimes these solutions to digital, to do digital preservation, they're beyond the means of even the most well-resourced collecting institution. And then even inconceivable at the smaller grassroots based, community-based archives. So we have digital objects, we have then problems in preserving those digital objects. And then the third one is that related to this is, but digital technology can be very helpful in creating new tools, new methodologies in order to analyze not only and find new meaning, not only in the digital objects, but also then in even the physical conservation based uh, or physical objects that need that could use these digital technologies and tools in order to analyze them to provide more data collection and access to objects. So those are the three overarching issues that we identified in the report. Next slide, please. So we'll go through the three critical areas of focus. Number one is preserving these technology-based cultural heritage objects. So as you know, because you are alive now, that audiovisual media that was captured, it captured our history and culture for much of the 20th century and going into the 21st century. And so that is the film, the video, the audio, the images, still images that we have, the computer-based works. But a lot of that media is on analog media, and it must be digitized for the content that is on those carriers to endure and, and be used in the future. Then we also have content that is captured as born digital, it was born as a digital object. So the infrastructure of collecting organizations can be just overwhelmed by managing all the storage. Video files, as you might know, can be very large. That can just overwhelm the infrastructure of even the largest and well-funded institutions. And then you have to do the digital preservation actions to keep that content viable for future generations. Okay, next slide. So the challenges with this first uh, topic is you need to choose, since there's just so much analog audiovisual content that needs to be saved, that was created and that should be saved. Appraisal and selection of those objects to be digitized must be performed. And you need specialized equipment. Again, it's all technology-based. You need the expertise and you have to have the large data storage capacity. Then you're going to be adding all of the new digital objects that are created from the analog originals to the uh, tsunami of the born digital objects that collecting institutions are receiving. And you have to do ongoing maintenance and preservation of these digital objects. So first you need to choose, unfortunately you have to choose, you can't preserve everything that's on the analog audiovisual content. So organizations must make hard decisions. Number two is then once you do have these digital objects, then you have insufficient data storage and migration. Migration meaning not just migrating perhaps a born digital file or object that can become obsolete, so you have to migrate it to a newer format, but also then you have to refresh the storage media that is storing that digital content, your hard drives, the solid state drives, your LTO. That has a direct impact on the environment partly through the server energy use, if you are using servers to store your data, and also, of course, the e-waste, because you must refresh the storage media over time. And so what do you do? How do you recycle that e-waste? You're also then, by using data storage media, you are helping or contributing to depleting the earth of its rare earth materials, because that is all required in manufacturing the data storage media, which is why e-waste and recycling is very critical for organizations to know about. So we can try to reclaim some of those rare earth materials off of the data storage media. 
The third challenge is just the limitations for digital preservation because digital preservation requires people. It's not just software. It's not just technology. It requires staffing. It requires software and hardware to manage these digital objects over time. That requires funding. It requires resources. Next slide. So the opportunities to meet these challenges are that we identified are number one is to try to consolidate digital preservation knowledge into a core national online resource. Because people who work in digital preservation, they pretty much know what has to be done, but sometimes it's hard to find resources to help them, these organizations to do that ongoing digital preservation that is required. So some kind of knowledge base in a consolidated resource would be very helpful. Number two is then to increase training in digital preservation. Focus on practical applications, not expensive and uh, opaque, difficult to use software or systems to do digital preservation, but focus on what can you do now with your existing staff, with your infrastructure, with their exist and so to train people, so your staff, so that they know how to use these tools. Number three is to establish cooperative data storage and e-waste recycling. So data storage, so again, you have efficiencies of scale. If there can be shared data storage that is secure and can go and will exist for a while, for time, then try to uh, establish these cooperative data storage facilities, try to have, and then to really reinforce the importance of e-waste recycling and to have resources to know, so people will know where to go for e-waste recycling. And then the fourth opportunity is to improve on cataloging systems so we know what do people have, what do the organizations have, and to have standards for not just cataloging, but also what are the standards for these digital objects that are being created, what are some of the formats that can be used. Okay, next slide, please. So the critical area of focus number two, so there are three we'll go through, number two is, which I made a slight reference to before, is the sustainability of community-based archives. So community-based archives are critically important to document the lives, the histories, the culture of a community, not just larger institutions deciding what should be saved, but the community is defining itself and what is important for it to save for into the future. They must be self-sustaining because quite often, for the most part, they are not attached to an institution. So while the community archives face the same issues in digital preservation as their institutional colleagues, but they have more challenges that are directly related to funding for the most part that further threaten their carefully documented histories. Next slide, please. So the challenges, money, financial sustainability. It's hard for these community-based archives to secure and steward traditional government and large foundation grants because oftentimes these larger funders they don't give funding to the smaller organizations because the smaller organizations don't have the infrastructure to manage their grants. Number two is the inadequate data storage. So they're storing these smaller archives or institutional, I'm sorry, community-based archives are storing just on hard drives sitting on somebody's desk. They oftentimes do not have multiple copies or redundancy of the data stored elsewhere. So if they lose a hard drive or that hard drive fails, they lose their cultural heritage because that drive has failed. So they need data storage support. So what happens then is number three is a challenge where because they don't have the infrastructure to do the digital preservation or to store their files properly, they then put up their assets, their content up into social media, into Facebook, into Instagram, or they have a website, which is fine because that provides access and at least something, it's going to be a smaller resolution file, it's better than nothing, but that isn't digital preservation. But oftentimes these archives, they, that is their only, that's their only chance to save their works. Next slide, please. So the opportunities here for the field to help these community-based archives is number one, funding, and number two, funding. So number one, increase and diversify the funding for the community-based archives. We have seen some fabulous examples already by the IMLS, the NEH, and the Mellon Foundation, and there needs to be more. And perhaps to encourage more is opportunity number two, create a multi-funder regranting initiative. So as some foundations might find it more onerous, as mentioned before in the challenge, to provide large grants to established organizations, then perhaps then there could be a regranting agency. Consider, for example, how CLEAR is working with the Mellon Foundation in the CLEAR Recordings at Risk project. So there could be more uh, 
examples of this kind of regranting agencies. I think that could help community archives. Number three would be to develop a national online resource or network of community-based archives. This can be helpful because right now to find a community-based archive is pretty much you know, just hit or miss. You're looking, it's just serendipity. You find out about it, you being a researcher or somebody who's interested. But having an online resource or a network where then organizations or the public can search here for a particular topic and they say, oh, these other community-based archives might have content on a similar topic in a different community. And then that helps all of us because then we find out about other communities that we didn't even know or had even thought about might have existed. So a national online resource that can help people find these community-based archives is also very important. And then the fourth opportunity is to develop an open source content management system that will then help these archives to be able to catalog, to provide access to what they have in their collections. This can be a cloud-based SaaS, a software as a service. It has to be something simple because the vast majority of these archives, community-based archives do not have IT support, but this is um, an opportunity that could be met. And so now I believe I'm going to pass it over to Paul to discuss the third critical area of study. Perfect. Thanks, Linda. Um, my name is Paul Messier. I run the Lens Media Lab at uh, Yale University. And um, what I'm going to be speaking about is our critical area of focus number three, which is expanding collections based knowledge creation. Um, as Linda was talking, as L Linda was talking about the imperative for preservation of uh, technology born analog and digital media. This group, um, this subgroup came, was looking actually ahead and looking and thinking about how can we harness new and emerging technologies to build meaning around collections. Um, specifically, you know, we're, we're thinking about scale in this case. Um, uh, if you might be familiar from art history, the, the, the term close looking, where you look very carefully at a singular object um, and try to understand all the details of its manufacture, where it, how it fits into sort of an art historical context. This is kind of the opposite end of the axis of close looking. We're, we're trying to think of collections really as data sets. And if we think about collections as data sets, both a, 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 a single collection that is um, centrally located uh, we can we can find patterns in that collection. But what if we can start, you know, if we have these data sets, what if we start linking across institutions, both regionally, nationally, internationally? And what patterns can we find there? Patterns about uh, regional trade practices, patterns that talk about spheres of artist uh, that that inform on spheres of artistic practice and influence. Um, these are the kind of patterns that we're, we're thinking, and we, we kind of, our shorthand to describe this is seeing at scale. Um, humans are, are pretty good when it comes to comparing one object to another object, or maybe five objects, but we can't hold 5,000 objects, um, the material properties of 5,000 objects in our head. We need technology, um, data science, data viz. Um, to really grasp the, the, these, these large scales that we're anticipating. Um, to do this work, of course, that is going to require really meaningful cross-disciplinary collaborations and really in, engaging new fields um, that traditionally don't really necessarily work in the cultural heritage preservation realm. And by that, I mean data science, statistics, data visualization, um, people with uh, machine learning backgrounds. The, we need entry points for this broad array of, of expertise to come into the cultural heritage preservation sphere. Um, could, could we have the next slide, please? And let me get my next one. Here we go, all, all set. Um, so challenges to accomplish this, this grand vision. Um, basically, modes of data collection and retention. Um, our existing infrastructures are built around largely unpublished technical data um, that relate to singular objects. 
and not really on the creation of publicly accessible data sets that span multiple objects within and across collections. Um, right now, our analytical equipment um, is extremely expensive and has a, has a high learning curve to master. Um, it cannot be operated typically by a, by a museum or, you know, a library technician. And so that's a, the, the instrument itself and the, the expertise to operate it, those are um, obstacles really um, for, for rendering data from collection objects. Um, so we have to think about um, broad, how, how do we make these instruments or maybe new generations of instruments more accessible. Um, also that came out of our discussion, an interesting aspect that came out of the discussion was, okay, we have these collaborations. Well, how do collaborations really break down and fail? Um, and usually it's around, well, we, we haven't aligned in incentives. So at a university where I work, you know, the incentives for somebody working in the humanities is very different than um, for somebody working in the sciences. Um, they have different reward structures. And that holds true for people working, um, professionals working in collections, curators, preparators, um, uh, librarians. They, they have different motivations as well. And getting those and getting that out on the table, like what what's in it for me kind of thing is a really important thing for a healthy collaboration. Everyone needs to get something. Um, and then there's this other sort of problem that we've got, which is, you know, there's it's the, the, the culture is changing a little bit, but it's slow. Um, a lot of collections think of their data as their data. And they don't tend to want to necessarily share it um, with a community. And that's something that uh, it, it's it's changing, um, like I said, but it's still a, a pretty significant obstacle. May I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, so within this sphere, what are the opportunities? Well, first of all, I mean, we, we, we don't really maximize um, kind of routine encounters with objects with, with creating data in mind. For example, we routinely photograph objects um, as part of a cataloging, um, you know, museum, cat, museum library archive cataloging. Um, but if, if, if the photographs aren't made to a specific standard, then we can't really compare things like color um, across that data set. But if they were, on the other hand, made to a specific standard, um, we can start, and, and we, you know, my lab has done experiments along these lines, we can start looking um, through using algorithms to look at the standardized images in the image sets and get, get an idea about the condition of, the, of a collection. You know, where is it? on its, its um, where is the collection going in terms of its uh, you know, march through time. Um, and we can classify individual objects and we, um, in terms of their condition, and we can classify really with the same algorithm, thousands of, of objects um, by condition. And that's, you know, again, simply leveraging something that's routinely done and, and, and bringing it up to a certain st standard for repeatability repeatability and interoperability. Um, as I was mentioning, instruments, um, you know, X-ray fluorescence spectrometers and, and, and uh, scanning electron microscopes, I mean, some of the, the great institutions in, in the, the world are privileged to have access to these um, analytical um, pieces of analytical equipment and the people to run them. But not every museum, every archive, every collection, um, community library has access. And we want them to be part of this, for, for, for this idea to work, this idea of creating um, uh, data sets that we can interrogate broadly, we need a really broad base. And so pri uh, making a priority of accessibility, maybe in, in fact, creating new generations of instruments that are mobile, 
that are inexpensive and that have a you know, relatively simple learning curve so people can contribute to um, these large projects. They can push data up to the cloud where it can be analyzed. Um, and and, they're, and they're, they can see their objects and context with um, um, other you know, participants within, within a, um, a, a project, this ecosystem that we're thinking about. Um, and I think the last kind of opportunity that we that we focused on really advocating for um, the fair attribution and credit for collaborative work that spans disciplines. And so to create these partnerships and programs that will provide entry points for a, a much broader base of scientists, engineers, data science, imaging specialists, um, that can help us build and conceive of really the next generation of tools and architect these new data pipelines. So I think I'll pass it back to Linda to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Alrighty, so all the different working groups of the Health and Trust Report, we were, going, we were all charged with also then, okay, you make these recommendations, describe the opportunities, but then, okay, try to put the goals, the strategic goals that would be, uh, that the field could take within the short, medium, and long terms, and you can see the date ranges there, to advance the state of digital preservation and research for cultural heritage. Next slide, please. So we have four goals, and goal number one is basically to define and communicate these frameworks, the standards, the benchmarks, to guide the preservation of this technology-based cultural heritage that Paul and I just gave an overview of. This can include to build a centralized resource as a knowledge base that would be hosted by stable institutions, so it won't just be up for a couple of years and go away. It needs to be up there for a while and have it uh, situated where organizations, people can contribute to the centralized resource. Develop cooperative data storage and digital preservation infrastructure to help these organizations and in particular the community based uh, archives and to increase funding for audiovisual digital digitization projects. So, as I mentioned, this analog material, it was not intended to last forever. It is at high risk. And so there needs to be more funding, even though there currently has been an increase in funding, there needs to be even more to so that this content can be digitized so that the content that's on these characters can be carried forward for other generations. Next slide, please. Goal number two is to innovate and foster new modes of collections-based knowledge, as Paul was just describing. This can include maximizing the existing opportunities for collection scale inquiry, as Paul said, seeing at scale. Collaborate in the creation of new data pipelines, prioritize accessibility and cross-disciplinary approaches. Next slide. Goal number three, build partnerships to lower costs and environmental impacts. Nobody can do this all on their own. There needs to be partnerships. So to develop guidelines on e-waste disposal for cultural heritage organizations, large and small, how is it that these organizations, how can we all become part of the circular economy, which is so critical so that we can lower our environmental impact by using all of this digital stuff that we create and we use? Part of this can be including to establish a national network of regional e-waste facilities so people know where they can go to responsibly dispose of their e-waste and also recycle by use exchanges. And to pilot affordable, accessible, cooperative data storage and asset management options. Asset management can be like managing your assets, your digital assets, as well as like cataloging and providing uh, access to the content, two separate things. And then to have these uh, cooperative efforts have a lower environmental impact because again, you then have efficiencies of scale. More people using one resource means that the, each individual organization doesn't need to do this on their own. Okay, next slide, please. And the final goal is to advocate for and build sustainability of community-based archives. So again, to encourage potential funders to establish programs for general operating support, not just project-based support, but keep these community-based archives alive through general funding. Advocate for the creation, again, for funding, of a significant regranting program to streamline the funding for these community-based archives. 
to create an accessible centralized directory database of community-based archives so they can all find each other and so it'd be easier for the public to find them and to launch a software as a service or SaaS based content management platform for community-based archives to help them manage their own content. Okay, next slide, please. So in conclusion, we all strongly recommend that you download the full report for Health and Trust. It's a really interesting read. Here's a URL for you to download it. Um, we're happy to have given you the overview of the digital technology section that Paul and I were involved with, but please do read the entire report if you can. If you have questions for Paul or myself, our contact emails are here. If you have questions or comments on the entire Held in Trust report, you see the email there for hit at culturalheritage.org. And so thanks, Pam and Paul, for participating in, for all of us to present to all of you and thank all of you for watching this video to learn more about the digital technology part of the report.